Uh, okay, so I think it's always good to, or sometimes good to start by explaining the title. So there are two pieces in it. Well, the first is per fundamental representations. And yes, the question is representations of what? So I will be talking about representation of uh, the algebraic structure that governs integrable quantum integrable models like Jungians and quantum affine algebras. And uh, as the name suggests, uh, and this terminology was actually introduced by uh, David Hernandez and uh, Edward Franker. Uh, they are the somewhat the simplest representation of, this in, of these algebraic structures. And uh, they are even more fundamental than what usually call the fundamental representations. And in particular, as you will see, essentially any other representation can be obtained by taking tensor product of them. The first example of fundamental representation were actually uh, introduced by Bajano Lucchiano cosmological in order to construct Baxter Q operator as transfer matrices. So to, co to connect uh, the Baxter operator story, which is a, a powerful tool in the context of integrable models connected to the representation theory of the relevant algebraic structure. This was the first part of the talk. I mean, the, of the title. The second part is about Hubbard model and ADS CFT. Uh, so there is an extremely remarkable quantum group uh, which governs the integrable structure of the one dimensional Hubbard model and planar and equal force free amuse with strings on ADS 5 times 5. It appears in quite different uh, ways in these two uh, item, items, but it's still an extremely remarkable uh, integrable structure which definitely deserve to be uh, studied further. And the question I will address in this talk is, is very simple, uh, is whether this quantum group admit pre-fundamental representations. Uh, well, you guess, maybe you know the answer, I mean, you can guess the answer to this question. Um, uh, but the second, uh, but I will not really address uh, uh, the question about applications of these pre-fundamental representations. I believe that uh, squeezing as much as possible the, the algebraic structure, not only me, many people believe that squeezing as much as possible uh, the algebraic structure of this integrable model is, is absolutely necessary to find, uh, to solve this system. So I will, in this talk, I will may mostly just uh, ask if these pre-fundamental representations exist and in another story will be a discussion on how to use them. Okay. Uh, Okay, so let's review some of the old work and be very concrete with some example about the fundamental representations. Please uh, feel free to interrupt me at any point. Um, uh, if something is not clear, which I'm sure I will, if I make a poor job in explaining something. So uh, let's start from the Yangian of, uh, of GLN. There are many ways to, um, uh, to, to introduce this algebra. Uh, but I will use a very conservative, I mean, a, a very a, a one which will be very useful for me to, to discuss representations. And so the starting point is just the, the famous Younger matrix, which is just an operator on acting on the space and morphism of C to the N times T to the N. And this just uh, depends on two complex parameters, X and Y, in a very in a different form. So you can shift X and Y and R doesn't change. And so it's identity, it's a linear combination of identity and permutation. And this very simple exercise that every, each of us should do at least once in his life is uh, to check and satisfy the Ambaxter equation. So this is a matrix I find this relation and uh, uh, it can be used to define the Yangian in the following way. So you take um, L of X, a matrix, so an element of endomorphism whose metric entries are, generates the Yangian, the element of the Yangian. Here I'm a bit sloppy, I'm not really saying what is the dependence on the parameter X here, but please forgive me, I think this is clear enough. And then you will say that you have, the Yangian is defined by the quadratic relations packaged in, into this nice form here in this equation star. Okay, so to the, to the gesture, I use the standard notation where um, the indices below these operators indicates in which tensor factor they act non trivially. So R12 acts on the two, first two tensor factor and L on the fourth, is L on the fourth and the third, and so on. 
I hope this is clear. So let me remind uh, just very, very simple elementary properties of the Yangian, which are totally manifest in this presentation. The first one is that if you have a, an L of X that satisfies the Allele relation, you can multiply from the left and from the right by two independent invertible matrices and still uh, have something that satisfies these equations. This is uh, coming from the, the fact that the Yangar matrix is GLN invariant. Uh, there are obvious properties that if you have a solution, we can obviously shift the spectral parameter by any complex number and still have a solution just because R is of different form. We can multiply L by a phase factor, or by a normalization, changes normalization, and still have a solution because this homogeneous equation and the normalization drops out. And finally, uh, maybe the most, one of the most important one is that uh, the, the Yangian is a Hopf algebra. And in this uh, presentation, the coproduct is just implemented by matrix multiplication. So if you have two L that satisfy this algebra, also the product. But this refers to matrix product in the first tensor factor and tensor product in the second factor, in, in the other factors. Uh, so if this is a solution, also this does, and this is, is the standard argument that let us build monodromy matrices out of uh, fundamental lax operators. Uh, and it's very easy to show that this guy here satisfied the RLL. Okay. Now, how do I going to introduce, let me introduce in a very simple way these pre-fundamental representations. So let's copy from previous page the RLL relations. And uh, there is a very simple way to find family of representation of the Yangian by starting from, uh, by just making an asset for L. An asset regarding is dependent on the spectral parameter and is leading order at large spectral parameter. So if you take these answers for L of Z, where L1 is by definition independent of the spectral parameter, is a very simple exercise to check that if you plug this in back in, into the RLL relation, you get that the metric century of L, denoted by L1 IJ, satisfy the GLN commutation relations. Again, this is an exercise that I recommend uh, everybody to do. Uh, and this observation allows to build many representation of the Yang, because we can pick any uh, representation of GLN that we want. We can tensor with tensor product repeatedly. We can shift spectral parameter as we want. So build uh, uh, many representation. But the question is, are there more? Did we miss something? And let's make a very simple generalization of the previous answer, where you just take, uh, instead of the identity element at large spectral parameter, you take some matrix A at leading Z, and then some B at uh, higher uh, next order, and uh, we plug it in back to the RLL relations, and we find that uh, they imply that the, matrix, the entries of the matrix A are central, so they are number, and serves a structure constant for the algebra of, of the matrix N, three of the matrix B. I will be specific, more specific in momentarily in a concrete example. So we are looking at solution of uh, error, solution of the RLL relations of this form. And uh, since A, I, J are central, and we have uh, the property, the first property here, that we have the freedom of multiply by left and right with G and F, well, what really matters here is only the rank of A, and uh, we can always uh, bring it to this form. So to be, uh, let's digest this notation. So this is just a matrix which has one and zero. It's, it's a diagonal matrix with one and zeros on the diagonal, and uh, there are one entries um, where the end, for the entry uh, associated to the index, to a subset of the index of one to n. Is it clear? So we take a subset of one to n, for example, one to five, and then uh, where n is fixed, for example, one to five, and then we take a diagonal matrix where uh, as entry one in the diagonal entry, one, one, two, two, and five, five, and zero otherwise. Okay. Uh, so Carlos, yeah, there is yeah. a standard question here. Yes. Uh, so official definition of Yangian 
has yeah. identity in one over the this, this, uh, expansion is by definition of the young game. Well, it depends. Yeah, how flexible. How do you want to define the, the standard uh, definition of the young game is, is what you're saying, of course, to article product. Yeah, so, so there's a standard, I mean, like there's official definition if you can't in textbook, uh, there it starts with identity. So your structure is not allowed. So of course, why it's useful, uh, but the question is, uh, uh, what is the reason to, well, uh, well, Yangen was, was defined for some reasons, right? Uh, so well, maybe having, I... have, having identity there uh, has some meaning. Apart just people, uh, uh, is this a question? It's not. So yeah, it is, it's I don't want to go into the deep math. Uh, 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 Carlo, yes, yes. Mitra, I could say just a sentence about this. So, uh, Mitra, I don't know if you heard what are called shifted Yangians. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a Yangian is kind of a special case of a shifted Yangian. And what uh, Carlo is now talking is what is called. Um, an anti-dominantly shifted Yangan. This is kind of a cousin of a Yangan. You can just say like this. Yes. So okay, if I Google shifted Yangan, I will uh, find answers. Yeah, yeah precisely. Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, isn't it? There are a few things. Uh, but yeah, there is also a story about going from the quantum of fine to Yangan, where in the quantum of fine case, there is no such a problem. It's just, I think it was just a kind of too restricting definition of the Yangya in the original Greenfield story. And then people realized that you can relax a few things. But exactly, uh, thanks for the reference. Okay. Uh, I hope the notation, so for, for now, not too much happened, just discussing this L of Z with this structure linear U over Z, where A is now of this form. And now let's take the example of uh, the Yangian of GL2, just to be concrete. Oops. So we start, we take the set to be a subset of the set 1, 2, which is the same subset 1, essentially the linear tree, the proper subset, together with 2. So, and this is the definition of the matrix A1. And then I just uh, renormalized L compared to here, multiplying by Z, but it's not really problem because of property, one of the properties I mentioned. And uh, uh, what one finds is that the matrix entries of the next two leading order expansion of L satisfy the oscillator algebra. Uh, here I'm actually cheating a little bit. I have to say, I will say my remark, but let's ignore that I'm cheating. Let's just take as a message that this object easily, is easily to show the satisfied parallel relation to the engine of GL2, and uh, his entries are taking values in the oscillator algebra of one bosonic oscillator denoted by A, this is commutator. And similarly for L2, if we start with this other asymptotic, you get this. Um, the example of the engine of GLN is, is very, very similar, and uh, now instead of, now here I decided by using permutation of row and columns of this matrix by Weil symmetry, to take the set i to be of this concept for consecutive elements. And uh, now a bar and a, the oscillators are not just single oscillators, but are just rectangles, rectangular matrices of oscillators to fill this matrix properly. And uh, of course, these are rectangles, so there are p times n minus p oscillators. But there is also a GLP factor. Oh, this one, okay. A GLP factor. So, uh, we have obtained some homomorphism from the uh, from this algebra, tensor product of H times G universal developing algebra of GLP into the Yang. Uh, sorry, maybe you yes. mentioned this, but uh, so uh, if I take uh, any matrices A and B with such properties, are you guaranteed to satisfy Young Baxter equation yeah. on your previous slide? Then? Yeah, so A and B. So, yeah, thanks. So, here I have to. In this second, I'm guaranteed, but in the second line, this is a bit implicit. So I'm saying AIJ is yes, a structure sir. constant for the algebra of BIJ. So in the same sense that the delta IJ are structure constants for algebra of EIJ matrices. Exactly. Just matrices with one element. So. That's correct. That's correct. So if you understand this sentence as you are saying, the second line here, then the statement is, is, is exactly. I think so. 
But uh, let's, in fact, just add a small remark, which is that, well, here I put the entry one. But of course, the young Baxter doesn't tell me that this has to be one. This could be any number. But as long as it's non zero, uh, I can rescale it up or down uh, using the, the property one that I already used. Uh, but if it's zero, I, I mean, of course, if, as long as this entry is non zero, I got the oscillator algebra. If this entry is, is zero, I'm getting uh, the L operator for the total chain, which is some sort of contraction where, where the oscillator algebra gets contracted to the Euclidean algebra. Uh, and in fact, I think Ruven has a paper with, uh, uh, with Vasily Preston, uh, I think, uh, discussing more in much greater generality this type of L operator, but in the classical case, if I remember correctly. But yes, just not to give wrong information, but definitely these operators satisfy the LL relation. Okay, now we introduce them. Let's now, they are pretty simple. I would say they are kind of even simpler than. Uh, the, this type of L operator here. But let's study one of the remarkable properties is how they behave under tensor property. So the observation, which is very simple, is the following. Imagine that uh, we, we take product of 12 operator such that Ai times Aj is zero. And this can be achieved, like uh, can be achieved if i and j are two non-intersecting sets. Okay. If i j are two non-intersecting sets, then the product of the matrix i, I with aj is zero. But this implies that the product L i and j is again of the form above that you have studied, which is still linear in the spectral parameter, which implies that we have we must have some relation of this form. Uh, let's see how this works for a young of GL2 in a very concrete two by two matrix setup where you can just check with your, with your paper. Uh, so we take the product of 12 operator as, um, as described in one of the first few slides. So uh, what do we have? We have an L operator, which is a matrix. So and C2 is the first factor, then the third and the second factor are, the, are two copies of the oscillator algebra. And we take a product of the matrices with tensor product in the oscillator space. And what we find is that up to the red bit, which you can ignore momentarily, you find uh, an L operator, which is the standard evaluation type L operator, like that. But where now the SL2 algebra is realized in terms of one copy of the oscillators. And uh, most importantly, perhaps, uh, the spectral parameter and the representation label j on the right emerge from uh, spectral parameters on the left, like so. Uh, the matrix G is there because it's there, but as you can imagine, uh, uh, taking trace over G, when we are going to take trace of our oscillator to construct transfer matrices, uh, G will give a trivial factor because there is nothing to, there is no a bar for this a, which is the conjugate of it. And as the notation here indicates explicitly, the matrix entry of G commutes with the matrix entries of L because L is a matrix um, whose entries are in the third tensor factor, where G is a matrix whose entries are in the second tensor factor. And, uh, and the matrix S is a simple similarity transform detects only on the, auxiliary, on the oscillator spaces two and three, and is introduced there for convenience to make it totally clear that uh, the matrix centers of curly L that commute to the matrix centers of G. Okay, now this is an if we are getting, of course, an infinite dimensional representation of SL2 on the right made of this oscillator, but uh, is uh, a remark should be useful useful in a second is that if 2j, which here is, a, is an any complex number, happens to be a positive integer, uh, the Fox space uh, contains a 2j plus one dimensional invariant subspace, which is spanned by the vacuum, a bar on the vacuum, up to a bar 2j on the vacuum. In fact, it's clear that uh, j plus x within this space, because it just lowers the number of oscillators, J3 also acts within because it's just counting the number of oscillators, while J minus uh, 
move you down to the chain, but of course when it acts on this guy, it's gonna give zero because this factor is going to zero. So it's clear, it's easy to show that this is an invariant for space. Okay, so we have introduced some representation and uh, hopefully I already justified the name per fundamental. In fact, if it's J is equal to one half, uh, you are saying that the fundamental representation of SL2 is obtained by tensor product of these oscillator representations. Um, so the name is already justified. But let me see, uh, uh, to show one of the first simple applications. So uh, how this uh, is useful to derive functional relations and construct Baxter operators. So in the usual setup, what do you do? We, we think about the quantum space of our quantum spin chain to be a representation of the underlying integrable structure which in this case, let's say, is the Yangian. And... Uh, uh, Carlos, yes. sorry. Yes. Uh, this, um, so uh, you have like two oscillator spaces and, yes. well, uh, it's a Fox spaces. And of course, in the Fox space, uh, and in each of them actually can realize action of, uh, of uh, SU2, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, um, so the question, so the question, you have these statements that Fox space contains to J plus one dimensional invariant space. Yes. I just want to get a feeling how non-trivial the statement is. I mean, because I can always find such space. But can you well, comment on the, the invariance? Invariance yeah. to what? Yeah, the, the non-trivial statement is that when J is tuned, when J is tuned to be an integer, I mean, alpha integer, uh, the L operator X, so the, the entries of this L X invariantly on this space. So they don't bring you, map you out of this, of this space, okay? Uh, that's the non-trivial bit. So what will it, this will imply is when you will take trace. So the point is that what happens is that is you would like uh, this Fox space to be the direct sum of a spin J representation or J, finite dimensional spin J representation plus an infinite dimensional minus j minus one spin representation as I will explain in a second. But this is not quite a direct sum. But when you take trace uh, or when you go to the Grothendieck ring in more mathematical terms, um, you, you, it doesn't matter if it's not a direct sum. You just get the direct sum of by, by, by taking traces. So this non-trivial statement is, is not that you can realize SL2 on the Fox space, but it's just that things are tuned so that you have this invariant subspace. I will go momentarily uh, in, a, in the next slide in, the, in more details. Carla? Yes? Uh, one more question. So you have two copies of oscillator algebra in here. Yes. Uh, but your Fox, Fox space, I don't see this, like, I would expect to see some some index notation on your oscillators. Yeah, it's, it's good. I'm a bit um, the notation is a bit condensed, but it's correct. So you see here L, mm -hmm. L has no indices in it. Uh, okay, but here as L one three, so it means that the first space is C two, and the oscillator uh, out of which J is made is space three. Oh, so this is the second copy of... Yeah, it's one, exactly. But for G12, it's the other copy. As the notation indicates, is acting only on the second oscillator factor. While L13 is acting only on the third oscillator factor. After, this is achieved by this disentangling of the similar transform. Right. So but, that subspace you have is, is basically, is, is a Fox space of a second Heisenberg. Yeah, exactly, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And also, what is conceptually the meaning of this statement that this product is simply can be factorized in such way? It's not very clear. Usually, we just have yes. product of two luxes and it's yes. not reducible to one lux. That's correct. That's correct. That's a very interesting. Yeah, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, that's very. That's what makes this thing pre-fundamental. So that's a deep property of it. So usually, as you are saying, usually you take tensor product, which means product of L, and unless you tune the spectral parameters, this is just irreducible representation. If you tune things, you can get sub-representation by the fusion procedure, right? But here is, but then you get some sums of sum. Here is, is just, uh, is what it is, you guys get 
uh, a tensor product of, uh, of these two representations and get this infinite dimension of spin j representation. And maybe, there is also all sorry to understand this using uh, Dreamfield uh, polynomials, even though I think it's been worked out really only for the quantum of fine algebra case. But I don't know if you're familiar with Dreamfield polynomials. Well, it's basically the highest weight of the representation, right? Yes, and the highest weight is uh, there is a current which on the highest weight uh, is just a rational function, is, is, uh, is a ratio of polynomials of the same degree. Right, yes. But for this pre fundamental, uh, the analog object is going to be a monom um, an object either with one zero or a simple pole. And, oh, okay. you, and, 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 uh, and so you can make, of course, rational thing by taking product of those, since this current on the highest way, the action of this current on the highest way behaves extremely nicely with respect to the co-product. Um, so yeah, in the representation theory, maybe that's the way to think about it, but here it's very concrete and uh, it's, it's a bit counterintuitive for us, but it's, that's what it is. These are, yeah, that's why they're pre fundamental somehow. Uh, okay, so this is a fact and uh, is the statement, one would read the statement that the tensor product of pre fundamental one with pre fundamental two gives uh, uh, the infinite dimensional spin j representation. Uh, okay, now let's, what, what, uh, what do we know? So we take a quantum spin chain, so the quantum space is a representation of some. Uh, uh, some algebra like the Yangian. And then we can pick any other representation with, with, that we denote auxiliary, we call auxiliary space. And we can associate an operator acting on quantum space to this V, which is constructed as a transfer matrices. So schematically, uh, you should think about it as a trace of auxiliary space of some universal object, which is uh, act on two sensor factor. One is the auxiliary space and one is the quantum space. Uh, uh, where we take some, when we evaluate some universal object, we evaluate in these two representation and we take the trace of the auxiliary space. And we are left over with an operator in quantum space. Usually here you are used to, uh, to having perhaps a product of R or a product of L, but this of course is, uh, is a, if you say that the quantum space is a product, then by Basic property of the R of the universal R matrix under coproduct, you will get the standard monotony construction, which is a bit schematic, and you can prove that uh, uh, this all. Well, the old proof is using the Ambaxter equation, but you can actually not use the Ambaxter equation and just use that tensor product uh, of v1 and v2 is isomorphic to the tensor product of v2 with v1, and uh, they form a commuting family, so that's the important thing there. If many operators commuting with each other acting in quantum space, if there is an Hamiltonian around, it's going to be uh, contained in this family in some expansion in some parameter. And uh, what are functional relations? Well, uh, the powerful thing of this construction is that uh, rep relations between the representations V, the representation in auxiliary space, translate into functional relation among the associated commuting transfer matrices. So a bit like characters do. This, in fact, if you think about this TV as some sort of quantum characters. And I will explain a bit better in a second in a concrete example. Uh, and just to set the notation, I will denote QI of Z, uh, uh, the trace over the oscillator space of this LI operator I discussed before. Uh, as you can see, I will, uh, though I didn't put in this notation, I will take the uh, GLP factor, if we, sorry, the GLP factor here, this J, curly J here to be trivial, to construct operators. Otherwise, you get some generalized transfer matrix, which is also interesting. And then, uh, as you can imagine, since this guy here is going to be a polynomial in the oscillators, uh, the trace is not defined, so it's not converted, so you need some uh, regulator, some, some quantity that you put here to, uh, to, to make the trace convergent, and it's compatible with integrability. But I don't want to go too much in details about this, these quantities. 
but let me also remark that while here the quantum space is the tensor product of the fundamental representation because L, each L was acting fundamental representation times oscillator space, uh, the generalization to other representation in, in quantum space is straightforward. Is straightforward. One need to uh, construct the appropriate for V tensor of quantum R for V is the oscillator space. And this is done by solving linear equations or otherwise meaning like evaluating the universal R matrix. I hope this is a bit abstract, but the, the message is very simple. You have quantum space, which is a representation of the Yangian. Then you pick another representation, which is the auxiliary space. Uh, you take trace over it to construct these operators, form a commutative family, and uh, uh, satisfy functional relations originating from um, a relation in the, uh, uh, in the representation category. Okay, so let's go through quick relations and put to good use the previous formula, which is this one, which we discussed a little bit. Okay, so let's put to good use this formula. Um, so we take GL2. So from that formula, please ask me a question which is not clear. Of course, it cannot be 100% clear, but it should be morally clear that uh, the formula I just show implies that if you take the product of two Q operator uh, with these spectral parameters, you get T plus JZ, which is the operator defined as the trace of the infinite dimensional Fox space, IS2 representation of SL2 corresponding to this L operator. So, uh, The, the, the relation in the representation theory, which was that L1, the representation associated to L1 and the one tends of the one with L2 gives infinite dimensional Fox space, is in, implies these, these functional relations upon commuting to transfer matrices. And then, uh, as, as is well known, if J, if 2J is a positive integer, uh, the, the finite dimensional representation uh, of SL2 with spin J is obtained uh, as the difference of the infinite dimensional uh, representation of spin j minus the infinite dimensional representation of spin minus j minus one. Notice that it's the representation of the same Casimir. And uh, if you take the first one and plug it into the second, you immediately have this quantity, these, these relations, that the, the transfer matrix infinite dimensional spin j representation uh, takes this form. And in particular, you can take j equals zero, and tj is going to be proportional to the identity matrix. And you get the first example of a QQ relation. Carlo, uh, sorry, uh, probably yes. I will uh, ask it still. Uh, mm -hmm. This again coming back to the definition of Young again. Uh, so you see when you define QQ operator's transfer matrix, you actually swapped a quantum uh, role of quantum auxiliary space in reality. All right, so a quantum space become a, a fundamental auxiliary and oscillator representation. That's correct. Or tensor product, since things behave nicely with respect to tensor product, the quantum yeah. space is going to be a tensor product of fundamental, yes. Yes. Uh, so, of course, I understand what you are doing. I'm not sure that and somehow it should be called, uh, because I do not understand that it's a representation of Yangian. So, again, so I have some definition of Yangian in my head, <laughs> and what is you're doing is not because only of identity, let's say, in this way. Uh, I mean, it's, 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 let's say, uh, Yangian in my head is something which has roughly a fundamental representation or defining representation of auxiliary space. And uh, then you can do fusion from it if you want. Um, well, I so, use, I mean, you, uh, Young is like more or less like Lij, if you wish, right? I mean, with Ij being from one to n. It's what I used to know to be defined as Youngian. Okay, and, so I, I'm using the definition of the Youngian I, uh, I gave at the beginning. So uh, no, well, exactly. I mean, in the beginning, you go, go. If you look at the definition, it's not what you are doing. Uh, you have R matrix, which is uh, U plus permutation, and tell uh, commute with it. But it's not this R matrix that you are using to in, in this context. Mm -hmm. uh, your space is your auxiliary space is no longer n dimensional. It's X Fox space, right? Yes, and, but I, as was described. So the only tricky bit is to prove that if you want to. I complain, yeah, I agree. I mean, there is good reason to complain about this. You can be, you can complain about the commutativity. So you can say, well, 
So uh, using the definition of Youngian, you can call it shifted Youngian if you prefer, or give another name, but I'm using the definition I introduced before. Uh, okay. Could, could I interrupt yes. you guys a little bit? So, um, Mitra, so when you're talking about spin chains, you have auxiliary and quantum spaces, and you have a Youngian, what you're doing, you're exploring the property that Youngian is a Hopf algebra, and that allows you to equip each factor, each auxiliary, well, one auxiliary and each quantum space with a representation of a Yangian because it's a Hopf algebra. Now, what Carlo is starting with a shifted Yangian. Shifted Yangian is not a Hopf algebra. It has a co-product. And in this particular case, what it does, it maps a shifted Yangian to a tensor product of shifted Yangian and Yangian. So eventually he gets uh, a representation of a shifted Yangian in auxiliary space and lots of representations of Yangen on quantum space. Never okay. even matches. But this is again, because once you go to shifted Yangens, we are not Hopf algebras, but something similar. Okay, so, okay, so answer is again the same. So what he has done is the representation of shifted Yangen for of auxiliary space. That is a matter, yeah. Precisely. I prefer the terminology. Okay. Yeah, this is good. I mean, uh, just uh, to understand how to call things properly. Okay. No. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, sorry. And again, once by the time Carlo had his paper, the terminology shifted Yangen was not there yet. So in a sense, Carlo was <laughs> <Thanks>. pioneer. <laughs> thanks. So uh, kudos to him. But uh, thanks. But uh, apart from term I mean, terminology is important because you can lose your other properties. So that's why somehow I stress that the way you prove that uh, t is commute is not in the standard way you prove it by using uh, the fact that it's a R matrix that intertwines with one and b two because in fact for this oscillator representation sometimes there is no R matrix with oscillator oscillator in the two spaces uh, but this is another stuff uh, apart from terminology I would like to stress what are the you know when a problem come in, comes in when there is something new to uh, to be done and to be discussed. But okay, thanks a lot for the, for the comment. Now let's move to GL1 slash one. The story is very similar, but is in fact essentially identical, but you can already see, if you don't want to go into this, if you look at this equation, if you replace bosonic oscillator with fermionic oscillators, as will be dictated by the gradient Baxter, this term, for example, is gonna be absent because if these are fermionic oscillators, it squares to zero. And uh, what you can see is that the product of Q operator uh, in the GL1 slash 1 case give a transfer matrix uh, where the auxiliary space is two dimensional, is the fundamental representation of GL1 slash 1. But the fundamental representation of GL1 slash 1 is actually a non trivial parameter, which is the central element uh, as a representation label which in this fusion procedure gives, uh, is just the difference of the spectral parameters. So similarly to here, the spectral parameters on the left recombines into spectral parameter and representation la label on the left, from right to left. And uh, when uh, the, the representation label is zero, again, the two dimensional representation of GL1 slash one decomposes into the, contains a subspace and decomposes into the sum of, uh, Oops, here I should have put, no epsilon, I forgot to remove it. Uh, it decomposes into the sum of T where the auxiliary space is the one dimensional single representation but the spectral parameter is shift. So notice that this minus is really coming from, it's just a trace of a two dimensional space, but it's, a, it's not a trace, it's a super trace. So that's why there is a minus. So we are taking a trace literally of a two by two uh, matrix, super trace of a two by two matrix, which is block diagonal, but all the factors are block diagonal in the product. And uh, it's just the sum of the difference of the elements in the diagonal. And uh, uh, by plugging again, this equation, uh, the T plus as this form into this equation, you get that the QQ relation of this type. It's a bit quick, but I hope uh, it gives you at least a flavor of how they work. So. Uh, how the, the tensor product of two fundamentals give an SL2, which is simply the dimensional representation, and then by taking a difference, you, you extract the spin J representation or eventually spin zero representation, and similarly for the supercase. 
Now for uh, GLNs Lesham in general, uh, by similar methods, you can prove QQ relation of this form. Let's just digest it more entirely. So uh, now we take, we have a set which has, we have N slash M. So we have a set and we can decide if you take a, a, an element um, from, of the first N entries of GLN slash M or the next M entries. And if you take two elements of the same parity, so for example, two elements from one to N or two elements from N plus one to N plus N, uh, you get these QQ relations, which are very similar to this one. So you can see here that you take a product of Q operator, one label by a set I, and then the other by a set I, where you added two elements of the same parity. And here you have the same spectral parameter uh, in an auxiliary space. And, uh, and essentially there is an SL2, I think on the AB indices, which can be reproduced by this product. And uh, and again, by subtracting the two, uh, the spin zero representation and the spin minus one representation, you get the singlet. And similarly for, for the fermionic case, where now you see that you have a set I and you add A and B of different parity, and uh, the relation goes in a bit of a different direction. These are very well known QQ relations, but they are transparently and economically derived with this representation theory method. Uh, I will review in a second how you get bit equation. Well, I will be a bit quick in the end. How you get bit equations from uh, from uh, from future relations, but it's very well known. Okay. Any question? Maybe it was a little bit abstract, but I hope the message was. I mean, if you want to do it, you should do it yourself with pen and paper. But I hope the message was uh, was clear. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so actually, maybe this slightly ties in with what Dima was saying, and maybe the answer is again just shifted Yangians, but I'll ask anyway. Mm -hmm. So if we start with monodromy matrix or lax operator in fundamental representation in auxiliary space, right? Mm -hmm. So we view this as some n by n matrix with entries acting on the physical space, right? Yes. An RLL relation gives us some nice commutation relations, right? It's like u minus v commutator of tij tkl equals whatever. Mm -hmm. So I put the auxiliary space into some, say, pre-fundamental representation as you're discussing, mm -hmm. then of course I can no longer view this thing as a matrix really, but it'll be some tensor factor, right? Something in oscillator, like some oscillator times some operator acting on physical space. Will I then be able to construct some nice commutation relations anal analogous to uh, RTT or something like this? Well, um, okay, so thanks. So if, um, let's see, so, you know, when you when you get up, you start from RTT, which is yeah, with this one, you start yes. from RTT, and now usually what you do, you take uh, T is this L, and you take uh, uh, an infinite series, let's say one over X for this L, starting with one. I, I mean, it's just a way to rewrite the very same equations mm -hmm. which are here um, with. Uh, uh, with the, with the, the, the component in the expansion at large x in some, in some Laurent expansion. Uh, if you do, I mean, th there are, I'm sure there are some paper about shifted Yang where they write them explicitly. Uh, you know, you could, but here, uh, yes, so uh, they have some slightly different, you know, they are just slightly different, they're just slightly messier, but you can, of course, write these, these quadratic relations. But, yeah, I mean, um, they are anyway, these equ the equation is the same. It's just, you're just slightly generalizing this one. Something. Uh, so let me, uh, let me, sorry, uh, let me rephrase. These are, these are uh, our matrix uh, for scattering of two oscillators. That's another question. So it's a good question. I think it's uh, equivalent uh, to both question. I yeah, see. So actually that's exactly like, so if I also put pre-fundamental into the physical space, can I use some pre-fundamental RTT relation as a building block for the usual RTT relation or something like this? Uh, no, I don't think I, so definitely you can start thinking about this equation where you play with space one to three and put whatever mm -hmm. you want there. So for example, you say one now is not the fundamental, but is the oscillator, one of the two oscillator representation. Okay. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the story is interesting, but it's also a bit tricky. For example, you find 
um, that uh, if you insist of looking at the RLL relation, sometimes even there is not, so you're asking about this, the R matrix with oscillator oscillator in the two spaces. Yes. Well, um, in one, let's see. Uh, if you look at now, the question is: Do I put the same the same type of pre fundamental in both spaces, or in one I put mm -hmm. one, and the other I put two? So if you put one in each, uh, there is some sort of you find that there is um, uh, an R operator. But if you put one and two, you find that well, there is either either nothing or too many because of this uh, very degenerate structure. So you develop, develop you, this huge center uh, in this product, so you find it. But let me say the representation theory doesn't quite tell you that there is such an R operator with oscillator oscillator, but you can of course ignore the representation theory and just try to construct it and you will see uh, that you can find stuff and probably you can use them. Uh, but let me also remark that for the quantum affine algebra case, the situation is much cleaner because, as is well known, the universal R matrix is not an element of two copies of uh, of the quantum of, fine, of the full quantum of fine algebra, but essentially of two Borel halves. So you need a representation of the Borel half to get a universal R matrix. But on the other hand, the Yangian is like already itself the Borel half is not quite the full quantum of fine algebra. Um, but in the, in the quantum of fine algebra case, the situation is pretty clear. You can see uh, from the universal R matrix what can you put uh, in which tensor factor in some universal R matrix. You, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure I'm not explaining myself because. Sorry, Carla, yes. can, can you slightly comment on this? Uh, two braille halves are associated in this case to, to L's independently or how? Okay, so here the Yangian should really be thought as half of a quantum of fine algebra. Mm -hmm. And so here there is no barrel half to discuss. In the Yangian case, uh, the universal R matrix is really like an element of the Yangian times the Yangian. So in a sense, if you start talking about this fundamental representation, oh, by the way, uh, yes, uh, Alessandro, I think he, he discussed how, uh, how to how to rephrase all this fundamental representation for SL2 in, uh, in Dreamfield, in the other Dreamfield realization of the young year, right? So. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I think what you, are, are you trying to say that it's difficult to define the shifted Youngian double? Or is there such a concept? Because that's what you need for the universal R matrix. Yeah, it was, I guess something like that. But from practical purposes, as long, if you have an R matrix, Sorry, if you if you take an R operator when one space is a representation of the shifted Yangian, if you wish, and the other is of the ordinary Yangian, then there is no trouble. The rule of the thumb. If both are shifted Yangian, there might be trouble. Uh, but I don't think there is a universal, you know, uh, uh, because the universal the proof of the existence of universal matrix is in fact based on this. Double, right? Double Carl, maybe just one more precision. Yeah. But this, uh, when when you have, when you build up, uh, when you have this combination of the auxiliary and the quantum combination for the construction of the uh, transfer and the, subsequently the Q operator, and you have this commutant family of the transfer matrices uh, on the auxiliary, is is this, is this crucial? Uh, because I think this is related to the uh, previous question. I think maybe what Paul was addressing uh, on the RLL relations. How crucial is this commutation? Can you find a, a counterexample when, 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 you, when you are not satisfying the auxiliary condition of the commutation? I see this is a good, uh, very good. So if, if, if I understand the question correctly, imagine that you want to show that, you want to show that two, operate, two Q operators commute. Right. Okay, I understand the question correctly. Right, right. If you want to show that two Q operator commutes, the old argument to show the transfer matrix commute is to show that is an R, there is an R matrix which intertwines V1 with V2, so R V1 V2, something like that. Yes. Which is exists and is invertible. That's the old argument to show that transfer matrix right. commute. Right. But for Q operators, it's not there. This R operator is not necessarily there. It's mm -hmm. R. And but if you think about it, all you have to show is that 
the tensor product of V1, V2 is isomorphic to the tensor product of V2, 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 V1. Of course, you can show that they are isomorphic, but by introducing an actual intertwiner, but they can be isomorphic even without constructing this, this intertwiner from the universal matrix. I but see. It's not, it's it could, if you want to, to, to build this in a, in a consistent way, this probably should be taken as a constraint, right, on, on these TV, TVs. Well, um, guys, so, so it's a matter of, yeah. Could, could maybe I suggest we continue our discussion in the break? Yeah, okay, thanks, yes. Okay. But uh, I agree, so the math, I didn't go to the, uh, yeah, this is a bit of a weak point, and I was a bit sloppy about how do you prove this commutativity, but uh, we, we can go later about it. Uh, if there is another matrix, uh, appropriate another matrix. Um, but what I'm saying is that you don't really need it. You just need to show that that the, the tensor product is uh, is isomorphic to the other direction. And in fact, also in the quantum affine case, that's what Hernandez and Frank Hill uh, used. Okay. So, Carlo, is it? Yes. Uh, ah, yeah. You, you want can, to stop? Can, no, you can go five more minutes if if it helps. To so this is the review. So another point. My there are two options. So the other is part two. Uh, and part two still contains some review material, but uh, if you prefer, we can just uh, have a few more minutes of chat now and then resume. I mean, if you want, we can have part one and part two. Oh, ah, okay. To each other. Uh, okay, if you're the yeah, end of part yeah. one, it, yes. then it seems like a good point to have a 10 minutes break. Okay. Yes. Okay. So. Okay, th thanks, Carlo. Thanks. But be, um, before the break, we, we have um, two announcements. So the first one is uh, from Pedro. If, so, uh, the, Pedro, if you're here, can you hello, share Hi. the screen? Yeah, please. It's all can you hear me? Yes. Okay, very good. Hi, everyone. So I will now share my keynote, just a second. <laughs> no, I cannot start sharing. Uh, yeah, let, let, let me stop here. Okay. Okay, so as you probably all know, the original plan was to have IGST in Sao Paulo. So it was going to be the first time uh, we would have uh, an IGST in South America. But of course, with uh, all this COVID stuff, we have to, to go online. And I hope uh, in, a, in, a, in a few years, we'll be able to, to meet in person in Sao Paulo and to have uh, another IGST in Sao Paulo. But uh, let me tell you about what's the plan for this IGST online. So he, I try to really be, keep only the most important information, which is in this slide. So uh, first of all, the website is, is written here. It's exact at ictpcypher.org. So you will find more information there. Uh, the plan is to keep the same date as originally planned, which will be August 24 to August 28. And uh, we'll do it on Zoom, of course. And we'll do it in the morning in the East Coast and in Sao Paulo. And uh, the plan is to do it uh, in uh, the afternoon in Paris time, say, where most people are. So this was a reasonable time. So it's the full morning for people uh, where I am, for example. And it will be the full afternoon for where most of you are, I guess. And, uh, and the plan is to try to have uh, six talks per day, but not really six talks. The idea is to have two 30 minute talks. So like 25 minutes plus five of, of questions and then a 30 minute discussion. And whenever possible, we'll try to make the discussion topic related to the previous two talks so that there is more option, more uh, opportunities to ask questions to the speakers, to engage the speakers a little bit more and to have a more informal uh, setting of discussion. So, so this is an attempt of trying to keep the spirit of IGST very informal, to keep lots of time for interactions. So in that spirit, we would like to try this format where we will have four talks plus two discussions every day. 
uh, with a big coffee break in the middle where we will leave the camera on and people can just continue discussing as well. And, uh, and that's more or less the spirit. Do register at the website. Uh, it's not, I wouldn't say it's really crucial because of course you could just turn on Zoom. It helps, so let me just uh, mention something. For example, it will help. Here is an example from our internal spreadsheet. This might still change a little bit. Uh, of course, not the names of the people, but uh, we might shuffle around. But here is an example, say from Tuesday, as it is right now. So we would have, say, two people talking about an amplitude related topics, or we group them like that, like Georges Panastasio and Amit. And then Simon Caranot will lead the discussion. And uh, I, I think he will ask, Georges and I meet more questions, raise questions to the audience and so on. And it helps the discussion leaders to know who is in the audience because uh, if there are interesting people working on amplitude in the audience, Simon will engage them as well and so on. So this will be very helpful for the discussion leaders. Similarly with Shota, who will be in this session that will have two small talks on boundaries. And then Shota will give his own discussion on a, a more like an overview, big picture, uh, discussion on, on boundaries. Uh, something I would like to do as well that worked very well at an, a conference that I was a few, a few weeks ago was Amplitude 2020. They had this Slack channel and Slack channel worked super well because after each uh, people that would give talks, they could create a channel and then people could go there, ask questions, other people would go discuss. It's all saved, people could provide references. It was extremely useful. And of course, to provide the link to the Slack and so on, it's very useful that we have a database of people registering. And also it's important for mail announcement in case we have to change Zoom link because we are hacked and uh, the previous Zoom now is full of porn or something like that. Okay, and uh, so, so that's basically it. Uh, so yeah, uh, I think it will be a fun meeting. And if you have any comments or suggestions, we will keep it very informal and we are still, willing to try things out but uh, for now that's the basic uh, that's the basic plan we still have like uh, a few slots left to fix we'll still make a few more invitations before i just see but uh, i hope it will be a very informal and interactive meetings like this ones here are i mean so i really hope we can keep the same spirit as this london integrability meeting so i don't know i don't think i forgot to say anything but and I don't know if any of my co-organizers is uh, that I probably should have listed, but it's in the website. But I think that's it. So hope to see you virtually and then physically in, a, in two or three years, perhaps. Uh, I mean, for the purpose of IGST, of course, physically before that. So that's it. I, uh, that was the announcement. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. And no, thank yeah. you. Thank you for uh, suggesting to give this talk. It's a very good idea. I will ask you also if later I could use your mailing list to, mm -hmm. to send the, the IGST link to everyone. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Great. Yeah. And we have another announcement now from Alessandro. So should I stop sharing? Uh, uh, yes, please. Okay. Okay. Thanks. See you at IGST. Thank you. See you. Hi, uh, so I also have an announcement uh, and it's also about uh, an event. Uh, some of you might remember uh, that uh, in uh, June we were hoping to have a conference in Padova, which was called the Great Lessons from Exact Techniques and Beyond. And it was sort of an occasion for some of the integrability community, but also maybe some of the CFT community to come together, especially for the European community and talk and see how beautiful the city of Padova is. And of course, uh, things went as everybody knows, so that, uh, that was postponed. And after much discussion, both with the speakers and uh, among us organizers, and also with some uh, part of the community, we thought it would be worth to try to hold the conference in person. So that was not simple. Uh, we had to talk for a long time to uh, people at the University of Padova and also uh, people and the, the local authorities to make sure that, you know, not only we could do it, but uh, that we were completely confident that it would be safe to do it. And uh, now I think we are happy to say that uh, we are confident that it is possible. 
So I'm happy to announce that the conference uh, will take place in person in Padova, of course, bearing uh, other calamities that can always happen. So let me see if I can share the screen. So there you have it, that's a conference website. And the announcement is that indeed the registration is now open. There will be no registration fee for this conference. Uh, the conference will take place from the 21st to the 25th of, the se of September 2020. Uh, it will be a very informal uh, conference. There will be plenty of time for discussions and uh, we plan to really have all the talks done in person and all the discussions like, like usually, but of course there will be some special measures. We will be in a very big auditorium and people will be you know, spread out so we don't uh, we don't have any sort of risk of uh, uh, well, uh, breaking any social distancing guideline. So what I would uh, uh, like to invite everybody to do is to have a look at this. And uh, if you can, it would be helpful if you start registering already now, because it gives us a, a, an idea of how big of a room we have to get. We have several options now. Uh, the, the point is that you see for 50 people, we need a, a room that can accommodate uh, 150 or 200 people. And for 100 people, we need a room that can accommodate 400 people more or less, because we want people to be spread out and even we, we want to be very cautious with this. Um, in any case, the registration is open until the 6th of September. We try to keep it until very late because we understand that some of you might uh, be a bit hesitating or you, you might be uh, uh, waiting for your university to tell you whether or not you can travel uh, and what are the new rules and so on. Everything is very fluid. So we try to keep it open until the very, the very last moment possible. And finally, one thing that uh, I, so all this information, of course, on the website. One thing that is not on the website, but uh, I would like to add is that if some of you need some sort of statement from us that uh, about the safety measures that we are taking in order for you to get authorization from you in your university to travel, uh, you can just write us and we'll try to, you know, to provide you a statement which details what we are doing so that uh, uh, you can get all the authorization that you need from your institution. So here you can see already some tentative uh, list of speakers. We don't have a program yet because things are very fluid. And uh, uh, the last thing that I want to do is probably to put in the chat the link. You probably received an email already. Uh, now my inability of using, let's see if I can chat. Oh, yes. I managed to share and chat, which is not very tricky. So I put it here in the chat. And maybe uh, we will also ask uh, Andrea to forward the, the link if people didn't get it. And I think that's it. Uh, if you have some questions, maybe I'll stick around during the break if you want to ask about practicalities because I understand it to be a, bit, a little bit uh, uh, confusing, maybe even worrisome. So uh, just feel free to ask. I have a question uh, about the organization of this conference. Um, will there be plenty of wine for disinfection? So uh, there will be one thing that uh, uh, on the other end we decided to do is that officially there will, and very sadly for me, uh, breaking my heart, there won't be a social dinner because we cannot officially say that we put you in a room, but we can certainly, you know, like create a process by which people will end up in a room and drinking wine, even if officially it won't be us <laughs> reserving the room and organizing a social dinner. Okay, thanks, Alessandro. So, okay, it's great news that uh, we have more integrability over the summer so, and uh, also maybe even in person in September. So, um, I hope to see many of you soon in IGST and maybe also in Padova. So, let's take a 10 minutes break and uh, we'll restart roughly in 10 minutes. Okay. Okay. And by the way, I see that Vladimir correctly is here, and I'm very happy about this. And so let me start by quoting. Yes, uh, I'm uh, by quoting a sent uh, a, par a paragraph from your book. Thank you. That I'm gonna read from the from the screen here, which is about the Abbott model. And they say, let us emphasize that the algebraic structure of the Abbott model 
is less simple and less well understood than, for instance, the algebraic structure of the isotropic Eisenberg chain. From the point of view of its algebraic structure, the Albert model is a subject of recent and still ongoing work. Therefore, the results presented in this part of the book are less complete than the results of this first part. Uh, we expect further interesting developments in the future in which the reader is invited to participate. I definitely can say that many people in the audience have already participated to developing the integrable structure of the upper model, of course, motivated by ADS-CFT. But uh, I think uh, it's fair to say that the, this integrable structure is still not quite fully uh, exploit, uh, explored. Okay, so now I will essentially kind of repeat all I said until now, but instead of the Yangian of GLN, and Yangian of GLN slash M generalized to the above model. If you're, yeah, I will be a bit technical, but please uh, interrupt me if you have questions. Okay, what are we starting from? We we'll start from an extremely can remote. Ask a general, can I just ask a general question? Yes. As understanding uh, structure, is that a physical problem we are trying to solve here? Is that a, a physical question trying to answer or? <laughs> I, I think you are, yeah. At the moment, as I said at the beginning of the talk, but I think, anyway, my question now is uh, start starting, uh, studying uh, the mathematical structure of this, of the integrable structure of the Governance Abar model. It's a, model of, of a math, it's a math question. Uh, can I, can I yes. add? Um, so, for example, a Hubbard model in one dimension for the infinite ledges has Youngian symmetry, and this is useful for physics because um, at half field band, scattering matrix of columns has the same Youngian symmetry. So, the symmetry algebra, algebra of uh, algebra helps to understand physics. That's all. Thank you. Sorry for interruption. Yeah, thanks. But also for Pedro, I'm presenting this here. I hope that some of you uh, can use it. I mean, there are these representation or properties of, the, you agree with me that the S matrix of uh, ADS, you know, the, the gel central extended SL2 slash 2 S matrix is an extremely important object in ADS CFT, an extremely important building block. And uh, studying uh, the structure and further properties governed by this S matrix uh, uh, is important. I'm not claiming that we'll have immediate application to the SFT, but that's why I'm presenting this structure here. For me, it's only mathematical motivation. But if you get some clue of how to use things, uh, please let me know. In the Albar model, as various application, I guess, the Albar model with impurities or generalization of the Albar model higher spin representation, all these sort of things. We can discuss separately, but for the moment, I will just address the, the algebraic structure part. Okay. Uh, open, open chain, upper model, and so on. Uh, but uh, I would be very happy to have some more feedback in the end of the seminar. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, start by introducing an extremely remarkable list of algebra, which for lack of fantasy is gonna be called G which contains two copy of SL2, which I denote, I denote the generator L and R, with indices going from one to two, they are traceless. So there is this uh, uh, six uh, bosonic generators, then there are eight fermionic generator, uh, which transform in two by fundamental of SL2 plus SL2, and they satisfy this commutation relation. So Q with S closes on R, L, and some element called H. And then Q with Q gives P and S with S give R, which these are just uh, epsilon tensor with two indices, anti-symmetric matrices, two indices, where the generators H, P, K are central. Okay, and this algebra possesses an SL2 group of automorphisms that uh, act on Q and S as a doublet, um, and on H, P, K as a triplet. And in fact, just to have a if as much as you can visualize this algebra, I think the best way to visualize is, is to think about uh, three-dimensional super Poincaré, where uh, P, K, and H are just the three-dimensional momentum. The other automorphism is just interpreted as a Lorentz group, and the rest is supersymmetry. And there is an RLL are just an SO4 R symmetry, but this is just for supersymmetry people that like uh, supersymmetry in various dimensions. Um, 
The Cartan of SL2, of this SL2 automorphism, provides a grading of the algebra, of course, which is uh, gives negative grading normalized to minus 2 to k, minus 1 to s, 0 to LRH, plus 1 to q, and plus 2 to p, uh, to, to the central element p. And uh, we can use uh, every time you have a grading, you can introduce, a, you can define a coproduct just by introducing a braiding factor that depends x, the coproduct of any on, any on any generator with a, with a braiding factor that depends on the weight. It's easy to show uh, that the coproduct preserves the algebra commutation relations. Uh, assuming that Q is central and, satis and is satisfied this property of the coproduct. As you can see, uh, uh, this coproduct is uh, uh, the coproduct and the opposite coproduct are different, where opposite coproduct permutes the two factors. But uh, uh, the beautiful story of integrable models, uh, the op algebra structure of integrable models, is that, well, it's different, but the difference is very uh, under control, under very good control. Namely, there is an, an object in some space that I will specify shortly that, uh, that satisfies this property that intertwines the coproduct, the coproduct and the opposite coproduct. If you look at this equation and take J to be any central element, which we have taken three of them here, H, P, and K, you immediately find that this gives you a, a constraint, uh, which you can uh, essentially, without loss of generality, you solve. Can you, oops. Um, without loss of generality, you can solve like that. So you, you relate the two central element P and K to the center to the element u, which is still central and used to, uh, to define the brain. Okay, uh, very good, so this is a nice algebra. Let's introduce the fundamental representation of it. Which, uh, and uh, the way we do it, uh, let's make also contact with the Abbott model. So at the Abbott model, at each side of the Abbott model chain, we have uh, a space which is four-dimensional, which this four-dimensional space is, um, is the Fox space of two fermionic oscillators, two spin up or down fermions. These are created by the operator C bar or sigma, this is each side of the chain. And it's pretty clear, uh, in fact, quite obvious that GL2 slash 2 acts on this space, of this, of this space like that. And these are, in fact, the degrees of freedom at each, at each side of the upper model. Uh, this is GL2 slash 2, is not quite G. But to get G, to get a representation of G, we just make use of the orthorotomorphism. So we take a representation of H and act with a very specific type, uh, a one parameter family uh, of uh, orthorotomorphism, like that. So you have the uh, generators of G2 slash 2, and we act on them with this matrix as uh, where QNS transform as a doublet and HPK as a triplet and generate the central extension. Um, with, this, uh, with this parameterization, which uh, is, was introduced by, by Bizert, and I will not go too much into the details of how it's derived, but it's in, the, it's in place to ensure that the central element P and K have this form. And, uh, and the fact that this is an element of SL2 implies that the spectral parameter, uh, which is here parameterized by the variable X plus minus, uh, is a point on this curve. Okay, so there is this the very first interesting property is that uh, to specify a representation of G subject to the condition mentioned in the previous slides, we, we need the, from nothing we get this this curve. So we have a, we have to pick a spectral parameter as a point on this curve. What is H bar? Well, uh, in the Abbott model, is uh, context is essentially. I times H bar is the upper model coupling constant, and the equal force per young mills, the young mills coupling constant is E I over H bar. So uh, what we see is that uh, H bar to infinity is the is the young mills weak coupling. So the spin chain, the standard nearest neighbor spin chain of an equal force per young mills emerges at H bar to infinity, uh, H bar to uh, to infinity. Uh, yes. And uh, we also introduce a spectral parameter to be, this, you know, to be this combination here. So instead of a minus, you put a plus, and this implies this, this, this two relation together implies this obvious relation. Uh, 
Okay, now, uh, why this? Because now let's take the fundamental representation, which is what I just described here, and look for an operator uh, that satisfies this property. Okay, they intertwine the product and the opposite co-product. And as was emphasized first by Niklas Beisert, I believe, uh, it is quite remarkable that this, this equation have a unique solution up to normalization, of course, which is given by this form. So this form, as far as I can, maybe it's obvious to the expert here working on the subject, but somehow this specific form uh, I, I never seen before in this way is a bit more complex than the standard form. So here Q and Q and L S are the generator of uh, C, the centrally extended GL2 slash 2 in the fundamental representation. And this form uh, makes it totally clear that when uh, H bar goes to infinity, uh, this R matrix becomes the R matrix of the uh, GL2 slash 2 uh, Yangian up to this simple Drinfeld Rechitic twist. I think you can see almost with your bare eye by noticing that X plus, my, X, plus X minus goes to infinity when H bar goes to infinity. Okay. Uh, I think many of you have uh, seen this R matrix, uh, but uh, if you want to show, for example, the size phi and Baxter equation, is already a pre pretty painful exercise. You can agree or disagree, but I think it is. Uh, it's essentially the Shastri R matrix, and as expected, satisfy the Baxter equation. Now I'm going to literally repeat what was done before starting from the younger matrix but now starting with this uh, with this very much more complicated uh, fundamental r matrix and this is the approach um, uh, that was uh, discussed by Weisert and Marius Nicholas and Marius a few years ago already and uh, so you just say I don't want to go you know to think well I have to think but I want to just look at the RLL I take an R and given an R I will look at L operator satisfying the RLL relation exactly as done before. But the exactly as done before, uh, what is pretty crucial is what is the leading, leading term of the L operator when the spectral parameter is large. And Niklas and Marius explain that if you take AI to be the identity matrix, uh, you can derive the uh, the defining relation of the Yangian of the centrally extended gel 2 slash 2, which was already discussed in a quite a few works. But you see right here that the breeding is not quite, is quite not trivial. The fact that there is the breeding factor here, for example, is very important. Sorry, this curly U here for me now is, is an R. It's just some parameters that I introduced in this ansatz, but of course it's non zero in the. Uh, uh, in the standard Yangian. So if you wish, this is a shifted Yangian version of the central extended Yangian, okay? So what is really non-trivial in this equation here is just the leading term, okay? If there is any question, AI is the matrix that I defined, uh, maybe badly, but before in the, one of the first few slides is the diagonal matrix matrix with, uh, uh, with one entry one uh, in the diagonal entries labeled by the set i and zero otherwise. But what you see all in this dot is a bit of a mess, but these are just, uh, is the most general four by four matrix written in some bases. So the first space as written in this equation is uh, and vf. So vf is just a fundamental representation, which is four dimensional, two, two slash two. And uh, um, yeah, so this is what we're gonna do. We're just gonna say, but. I don't have to think too much, just let me make an answer with a certain leading term and just give names to the rest. Where i is a set, which I somehow times uh, split like that, where one, two, let's say, are bosonic indices and three, four are fermionic indices. And it's exactly as before and without too much uh, surprise, the choice i of the set i determines the algebra satisfied by these guys here in this algebra a h, and uh, which I denote that g x cap y, where x cap y is the set. And it turns out that uh, essentially as before, this algebra is isomorphic to the tensor product of an oscillator factor times uh, universal locking algebra of this factor, which I will now review more details in a table. Okay, so this algebra is, uh, so what are the set, the possible sets? Well, up to diedra group where is a, it exchange one with two, three with four and one, two with three, four. Up to these transformations, these are all the possible sets. Uh, 
so these are all the possible L operators up to this diagram group. And uh, so if the set is zero, it's a, it's a trivial operator. If the set contains only one element, is that there is only the oscillator factor, like for the previous example of the Yangian. If this factor has a bosonic and a fermionic uh, entry, there is a bunch of oscillators. These are bosonic and these are fermionic, and there's gl one slash one factor and so on. Uh, these are all standard oscillator, and this is all standard GL factor as written here. Uh, but what is already a, um, a bit interesting is how the central extension shows up. So these are fermionic oscillators, this C and C bar, but somehow they are kind of centrally extended fermionic oscillators, where H, of course, if H bar goes to infinity, the central extension turns off. And uh, the parameter U, which was introduced here in the asymptotics, sometimes enter in this specific form of the isomorphism. So the algebra doesn't quite depend on you, except for this case, but uh, the isomorphism does depend on you. So we have introduced this algebra. And the non-trivial fact, but which is true, but nevertheless true, is that uh, you know, we have assumed, we have looked at the asymptotic and define an algebra. And what is, happens to, to be true is that there exists L operator so the series, uh, you know, you can go all the orders and, uh, and there exists an L operator that satisfies the RLL relation and that are two given above. So we have the pre-fundamental representations. And the expression is actually pretty simple. So the R matrix is a mess, but the L operators are pretty simple. So what happens is, for example, when the set is one, so this LI depends, R, which four by four matrices, uh, with entries are in the uh, made of uh, one bosonic and two fermionic oscillator, A bar and C, and there's just this, this simple form. So these um, matrices here in the exponent are nilpotent, so uh, just the exponent from Kate, but this is a very compact expression. And uh, uh, M, this matrix, which as the notation, notation indicates, is only on the first tensor factor as this very, very simple form. So let's, where the AI are the matrix I defined before. So if you want to digest, uh, so what are we finding? We find that there are two parameters. One is U, curly U, which was introduced in the asymptotic, that you should think about the spectral parameter for the fundamental representation. And then there is the X plus minus one parameters in this straight U, which are associated to the, to the NV, to the fundamental representation in the first tensor factor, okay? Uh, for the remaining sets, so this is what the simplest set, uh, this L operator will have more parameters, of course, and one parameter will be the spectral parameter and the other will be a representation of, uh, of this, uh, which are usually intertwined uh, in a non-trivial fashion. But uh, when uh, we realize the GL star I factor trivially, um, we, are left, uh, we are left only with one spectral parameter. And uh, when the set I, is one, two, or three, four. So when the central extension is visible in the oscillator algebra, the spectral parameter is actually not a complex number, but is, is literally a point on this curve, where this is the Zhukovsky map I thought I introduced before. But I uh, so z of x is x plus one over x. And otherwise, the spectral parameter is an, is a, is an element of c of the complex plane. Uh, sorry. Uh... Can you remind who are A's? Yes, thanks. So A's are the matrices with, uh, are diagonal matrices in uh, four by four diagonal matrices. And the index upstairs, the nodes, if they have the entry, where the entry one is in the matrix. So for example, A1 is just the diagonal matrix one with diagonal one, zero, zero, zero. A2 is zero, one, zero, zero. A34 is zero, zero, one, one. So M1 is a very simple diagonal matrix. Okay, but then uh, I'm confused to where, so M1, M1 is just diagonal matrix, it's just some number. That's correct, right? that's correct. But there is this mate is multiplied from the left and from the right by this factor. So should I care about them? It's not a just a rotation, it's something more No, 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 it's, it's not. You see, there is a bar on the left and the A on the right. Okay, it, it's so. It's more complicated. But it's the same, the same structure is true also for the Yangian, even though I didn't show it. We can rewrite the L I showed before for the Yangian case. Yangian of GLN or GLN slash M in this way. 
Okay. So in, in fact, also in this guy, you can just take the h bar to infinity limit and, uh, and find essentially the Youngian of GL2 slash 2 up to uh, this Drinkfeld relationship twist. Okay, by expanding the exponent, it will reproduce your previous formulas, right? That's correct. I mean, this is a bit a generalization because now it's really solving a parallel relation with, uh, with this R, with the R of, uh, of Shastri. Yeah, but you will not stop at the first term only, you will go like for a long time. Exactly. So the point is that this is exact formula. This one is an exact formula. I just introduced the algebra uh, with this UG by looking at the first order. But then I, I realize what the algebra is and I replug it back in the RLL relation and solve exactly in closed form for L1. So this is just a closed formula, all order in, uh, in large little u, if you wish. Large little u is, so I was taking the spectral parameter in the fundamental representation to be large. You know, little u, which is, you know what I'm talking about. Okay, and for this spectral parameter, so you say for i equal one, two, and three, four. Sorry, it's i equal one, two, yeah. or three, four, or one, two, three, yeah, four. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, not, uh, or three, one, two, or three, four. Yes. Or, yeah. So like for two choices so far. For, for two choices, yes. You say there is no freedom on spectral parameter. It means I'm not sure how to interpret it. So I understand that everybody should be functional spectral parameter that I'm used to. But what you're trying to say here is that. Uh, so, so he's saying that it's just it's similar to R, right? So for the R matrix, each space, uh, the spectral parameter leaves, you should think about the spectral parameter as a point on, on this curve. Okay. No, but H is not fixed, right? I mean, uh, uh, H, H, bar is H bar is fixed. Of course. I mean, you think about it as being fixed. Uh, no, I just don't understand. For, for us, R matrix or Shastri R matrix, you have yes. spectral parameter, right? Well, but the spectral parameter is not a, comp it's a complex number, of course, but it's not an element of C, it's an element of, of a curve. Uh, okay, so it's not a point, it's, it's oh, it's a I point. I mean, it's a point. It's, 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 it's yeah, no, yeah. any point, okay. It's an element, yeah. Hello? Yeah, okay, so I'm sorry, it's, it's a point on the curve. It's not yes. some, the point, okay, it's a point. Yeah, exactly, yeah, it's any point on the, yeah. It's living, okay. on, the, it's living on a curve instead of the complex plane. Mm -hmm. uh, and the same is true here for the Q, per, well, will be true for the Q operator, but only when the inset is one, two, or three, four. Yeah, okay. But, but you see the simplicity, this L1, in fact, will be used to construct the Q operator, which is in the Libou equation. One of the Q operator, okay, anyway. So, uh, the message is that they exist, it's good, but they are also remarkably simple somehow. So before starting, I would have expected to find very complicated, since the R matrix is so complicated, I would have expected the L operators to be very complicated, but actually it turned out they are pretty simple. Of course, I'm partially cheating because L1 is the simplest of all, but uh, the other ones are just slightly more complicated. Okay, uh, very good. Now. We follow exactly the same pattern as before. We take tensor product, which in the language uh, used before is just the product matrix product. So space one is the fundamental, is the four-dimensional space, fundamental representation of GL2 slash two. And uh, uh, the other factor are just the, the algebra I just defined and uh, show in the table. If you have a question, just let me know. And exactly as before, uh, the product of such operator is essentially the L operator where the set intersects, but there is going to be a quite more non-trivial dynamics on how the GLI cap J factor is realized in terms of the GLI, GLJ, and oscillator factor. Okay. Uh, since this might seem pretty abstract, let's just uh, give the answer for two examples. So if you take the sets to be uh, one and two, so two, for example, one and two, so uh, GL star IJ is SL2, because one and two are both bosonic. There is only one oscillator, and you find exactly uh, that the SL2 is realized exactly in the Fox space as in the Yangian case, but this is not a guess, I mean, this is not a something that you put in, it's just something that comes out from the product. You don't have to do, you don't have to do anything, you just have to take the product, 
and see what, what comes out on the right. And what you see is that this, the spin of the SL2 is, uh, is related to the parameter. So we say that it operates L1 in the uh, space associated to the oscillator as only the parameter, spectral parameter U, which is a complex number, maybe invertible, maybe not, you have to be a bit careful. Uh, and, uh, and you see that, so you have two such operators, and you see that the spin of the SL2 on the right is as this form. So you take the, the parameter u, you square it, you scale with h bar, and you take the Joukowsky. So in particular, if h bar goes to infinity, you see that you keep curly u fixed, and uh, here finally I wrote the expression of z of x. And, uh, and so you get this, this property of fusion. So it's very similar to the case of the Youngian, but where the Zhukovsky map appears uh, uh, naturally and automatically. Similarly for ones, uh, one and three, you have a GL1 slash one. And now the, uh, the representation label epsilon, which is the one I used before. So epsilon is zero is, uh, is the special point where the, the representation is not irreducible anymore. Uh, as this form in terms of the spectral parameter of L1 and L3, okay? Um, there are more formulas, but they have the same spirit. And now I'll be very sketchy because I was running a bit out of time when preparing the seminar, but I can ask you, we can ask even more in private and also time is running out. I don't want to bother you too much. But now from here, uh, QQ relations are just gonna be a matter of checking the conventions and the normalization factors here and there, okay? So let's see uh, how it works. For example, you see this second relation. There is a, if you take the product of L1 with L3, exactly as we did before for GL1 slash 1 in the Yangian case, if spectral parameters are tuned so that this epsilon is zero, uh, you get a direct sum of representation because it's dimensional representation of GL2 slash 2. Uh, decomposes and this, uh, this boils down to this functional relation. So uh, the condition, of course, this condition is solved by saying that one is the inverse of the other and, and you find that Q1, Q3, these are very explicit operators that you can construct uh, using L1 that I showed before and L3, which is just a dihedral transformation of it. Carlo, can I ask? Yes, you? yes. Uh, the Q, that, uh, that it's Q you know or how do you know it now? The, I mean, you get to call it Q. Did you? Did you? Can you evaluate like uh, there's a matrix or? So uh, this L, this is met, This is a matrix L one. Yes, but then you have to take the trace. And now we will do some. I mean, do you know that the trace diverges maybe? Or yeah, yeah, sorry, it will like, be is the, it well yeah, thanks. Or, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. Is the, is the standard? I skipped a bit, but it's exactly as in the Yangian case. So you just take this matrix, you take tensor product, and then you put the regulator factor, hmm. as usual. So you need this twist to make the trace convergent. Yes. Yes. It's a deformation of the Youngian of GL2. Of, it's a deformation of a drink further acidic and twisted version of the Youngian of GL2 slash uh, 2. But do you need regulator because you have H bar now? Uh, you still, you still, I, I thought you didn't because of this drink further acidic and twist, but actually you do need the regulator. I mean, you can work, that is my regulator bit, but no, you, you do need the regulator. At least, yeah, that's, but it's not, you know, we know that the regulator is, there is nothing bad about the regulator. You need the regulator, you need this twist. Okay. Uh, okay, so the Q operators have exactly the same form as I showed a few slides ago for the Youngian, just using this L instead of the previous one. But of course now in principle, you can take a, uh, a quantum space, you know, you can take a fully inhomogeneous a fully inhomogeneous uh, chain in quantum space. So every side of the quantum chain will have an X plus X minus attached to it. Okay. While U is the auxiliary space spectral parameter and will be something we can play with. X plus X minus at each side will, will parameterize our choice of uh, commuting family of operators, so the quantum space. Uh, okay, so for example, now you can immediately prove this relation. Uh, there is a small, there is this plus and minus here, but Q plus minus are essentially the same object uh, up to a shift, but the normalization of uh, this capital Q plus minus and Q13 uh, depends on omega, while 
Q13 is a polynomial in uh, uh, up to the usual non-polynomial factor uh, related to the twist, but let's ignore it in this in the spectral parameter of h bar omega, where omega is u square. Okay. So this is the first QQ relation. You can check it even if you, to make sure that it is not a mistake for small length. Um, and uh, so this is and this is an immediate consequence of this functional of this uh, relation between representation fusion relate, tensor product relation. And then there is some other QQ relation, for example, where you take uh, a product of Q1 and Q2, where the spectral parameters sit on a curve uh, I defined before, so which is defined this this curve where j is zero. So y1 and y2 have this form, uh, z is your cross schema, and if you take j equals zero, you define a curve which is this curve you see, and you find a QQ relation. Now, if you want to go to lib vu equation, uh, or bit equations, you can, for example, the, uh, one way to do it is to just take the Q function that will appear in the in the in the beta equations are the zeros of q1, q13, and q134, for example, and use the first q. So now you proceed in a standard way. You take this this one. Uh, you sit. You, u is your choice. So not nobody tells you what u should be. Capital U. So you take capital U to be a zero of q1, and so you get the ratio of these two q's is uh, evaluated where omega is a zero of q1 is equal to one or some factor depending on normalized plus minus, which is the first of the Libre equation. Okay. I'm sorry if I'm a bit abstract, but uh, you can re realize it. Uh, there is also some research on that. And then, of course, and then uh, if you keep going, you take this other QQ relation, which is some sort of bosonic plaquette. Okay. Uh, here I, I didn't put the spectral parameters, but there is this QQ relation. So, one three is one Q that we used already. And now, uh, what is the game? The game you uh, you sit, you, you you have the spectral parameter, you even kill, you either kill this one, you fix the spectral parameter to kill this factor or to kill this factor and take a ratio and you get QQ relations. Uh, sorry, and you get another bit equation involving uh, evaluated essentially at the zeros of Q1 slash three. So should well, there be yes. shifts on the right hand side? Yeah, yes, yeah, there are shifts. Uh, I just didn't want to, a bit, since I was, I was a bit sloppy here on the definition, I didn't want to have, the, but yes, exactly, there are shifts. Um, plus, here there is the shift, and here there is plus minus one. Plus minus, uh, well, in this convention, plus minus h bar over two. Okay. Uh, and then, finally, there is also this other QQ relation, which is, again, a fermionic type of node fermionic type of bosonic fermionic plaquette and then you just take a z you evaluate it on a zero of uh, of uh, of uh, uh, of q134 of a q134 so and proceed in the standard way which is the one i was kind of describing in work but it's a well-known way to do it uh, and this produce the equation that are, for example, in this paper of Niklas, where you also explain how limp equation are obtained from a certain limit of the x plus x minus parameters in quantum space. Um, so a small comment that you can immediately complain, but maybe if you're familiar, it's not a, it's a, it's an obvious one, is that limp equation are just kind of two. They are they are uh, there are naturally two group of equations. But uh, one equation uh, is essentially taking into account the zeros of Q1 and of Q134. So you could kind of, if you have the, the, uh, the, uh, the Q functions, you could essentially take the product of Q1 and Q134 and, uh, and take it as a, as a combined object in the, in the Lebo equation. I hope this is clear. If not, I can explain it later. Okay, so. Is it correct to say that they're uh, the same function that if you go through the Zukowski cut, you get the other one? They're just an analytic continuation of one another? Yeah, I think with the twist, is not, uh, well, my impression is it's just that uh, when you have the twist, this is not true. So for Q functions, maybe maybe in, in the, in the Lipov equations where you have the no twist and uh, 
that is true. But uh, yeah, I think it's, as, as operators, they are just, as far as I can tell at the moment, they are just different. But we, we can discuss more details. Uh, that, okay, this, uh, I just wanted to prove a point that tensor products, as in the Yang Yang case, immediately implies Lipov equations. There are uh, many more algebraic uh, properties of this, uh, of, of these uh, pre fundamental representations, uh, generalization to higher spin in quantum space, which I find interesting. But just let me mention just a fun one, which is that. Uh, if you take the Pronsor product of pre-fundamental one with pre-fundamental two, three, four, and take the, um, the, the GL star factor for this L operator to be the trivial one, to be realized trivially, uh, you obtain uh, the Cubam state representations in the tensor product. Uh, so you, you find that, and in particular, if you theorem Q to be one, so if you see it on, on, on this curve, you find that where x plus and x minus are defined here, um, you find that R itself, the R matrix itself, is a tensor product of this fundamental representation. And I think this property might be might be useful to to rethink about this this R matrix or S matrix, which is used so many times to just even in the bound state representation to just factorize it out as product of of these more very much simpler simple building blocks. So I think it's pretty remarkable that. You know this uh, L1 is, is so simple, and uh, L L234 is very similar. It's kind of its inverse, and then their product is uh, is the is the fundamental times bound state R matrix. Okay, so let me conclude. So the this, the summary is that the fundamental representation exists for this uh, quantum, this very interesting quantum group. And on the mathematical side, I think there is still a few things to understand about the representation theory of this algebra. Maybe find the universal R matrix if you if you like these sort of things, and uh, maybe consider the quantum affine version and open chains. On the physics side, maybe there is a few computations which, in the in the context of Hubbard model, that could be revisited using uh, the operator construction, maybe derived analytic properties. And, uh, and sorry, the thing I didn't mention much is that uh, I believe it's going to simplify the discussion of the Hubbard model generalized where the quantum space is exactly the cubic state representation. Because we could even just take a spin chain where uh, the quantum space is alternating tensor product of fundamental one with fun pre fundamental one with pre fundamental two, three, four, and so on and so forth. So this may be as an interesting, uh, as interesting condensed matter application. I don't know. And discuss them if you're interested. And uh, and finally, well, I hope somebody has something to say about it. But I hope at some point they will have some um, some application in the solution of of, of any converse pair meals and strings in this five just five. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Carlo. So um, I'm gonna un unmute everybody. So uh, let's thank the speaker. Can I make a small comment? Yes. I think perhaps uh, I wonder if one application or one direction to think about would be to try to simplify these hexagon integrands. So when we decompose correlation functions using hexagons, we are instructed to taking S matrices, which are these S matrices of the Hubbard model, right? In mm -hmm. the bound state representations, and that's yes. the same part. And then multiply many of them together. Yes. Right now, the only way we know how to do it is to, to ask Tiago Flori in the chat. I see. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a fifth bound state multiplied. And uh, it should be clear that there should be a, a better way of doing it. And uh, if you could, with this Yangian symmetry, constrain the final result of what is the contraction of many S matrices that you take and contract them together and multiply them into a scalar. And then if you could try to understand if there is any Yangian application, any Yangian consequence that could directly find this final scalar, this rational function, that would be great. Can I make a comment? 
Sure. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, the scattering matrix in the Hubbard model was calculated some time ago. I sent the um, through the chat, the reference, and it does has uh, young and symmetry. That's the reference. That's the end of my comment. Sorry for interruption. Um, but yes, uh, yeah, thanks. But Peter, yeah, I, I exactly mind something like that since these building blocks that you just mentioned, the S matrix with bound state enters so many calculations that you have to sum over the bound state number. Yes. Uh, I think it is. Uh, uh, this form might be a technical. <laughs> This is one of the main obstacles for uh, the, sure. all these hexagon programs, is that the objects we get when multiplying these as matrices are very complicated. And, uh, so this will be an example of a concrete application. Yes, but, but this multiplication is uh, it's just, you know, you just multiply literally the matrices, just you take a matrix and you just multiply. Uh, there is a matrix and then yes. you connect one leg with another S matrix. Yes. For example, an example is like Young-Baxter, right? You multiply them in yes. a bunch a way to check young Baxter, but you, you can yes. do more complicated topologies where after you check young Baxter, you connect one leg in the past to one in the future, put another S matrix. It's like making a, a grid, a lattice. Yeah, that's great. So this, I think, is exactly where the that. The corners are S matrices and you sum over the bound state index as well. So it's, yeah. it's, some, kind of, it's some kind of twisted partition functions because you not only multiply S matrices, but you measure the quantum numbers of the states flowing and you have some chemical potentials. So it's like you have some kind of a partition function where the vertex of the partition function is this Hubbard S matrix, R matrix, sorry, the Hubbard R matrix, and uh, where you have many chemical potentials at the various legs. And, uh, yeah, so it's exactly the type of application. Yeah, essentially you can ideally take the vertex and just make it into four vertices, okay? But each vertex is gonna be much simpler. You know, since the, this Q bound state representation is a tensor product, you should make each line thick. You know, and you can make each line corresponding to bound state representation into two lines. And each vertex, you know, is gonna. So I, I should look at the formula maybe SQ or Tiago. Um, I, I mean, it would be great if, if it simplifies this type of calculation. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, can I also ask you a question? Sure. Uh, so you essentially just uh, discussed all of the QQ relations. So I guess you also have TQ relations, uh, which which follow more or less automatically from the construction. Yeah, even though for super, actually, I don't remember anymore too much about TQ relation in supersymmetric case. But yeah, I, the relations are going to be essentially uh, the formation of the Yangian of GL two slash two. Okay. Yes. Uh, the only kind of feature is this sort of, you see like here, that you have this QQ relation here, uh, where U1 and U2 are just not, you know, distanced by a factor of alpha or what, of one or whatever. They are just literally on a curve. You know what I'm saying? You know, it's a one parameter family of QQ relations, but the parameter is not just Arbitrary is just a very constrained thing. Um, so your question about was the Q relations, yes. So essentially, even though I didn't go all the way, I'm pretty sure that uh, all the relations are essentially a deformation of the Yangian of GL2 slash 2, but with this fact feature I'm just describing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Okay, are there any more questions for Carlo? Your expression for L, for Lux operator for like L1 you showed. Yeah, I showed L1. Yes. Uh, the so, the question, yes. Yeah. so the question is uh, how important that your algebra is GL2 slash 2? Well, here, uh, the, the simple answer is just that I use this, uh, I mean, I start from this, uh, from this R matrix. No, but if I just look on the answer and try to change rank, will I be successful? Okay, so I, I doubt you will be successful, but uh, um, you know, it's not so clear what to, 
you could try, well, first of all, remind that Q are just, they satisfy the centrally extended algebra disputes, even though here central extension is not quite visible. But uh, I, I doubt there, there will be something that works for a year rank for different ranks but i do think it will work. i mean it does work the first comment is that this formula is actually is an immediate generalization to any so here the first tensor factor is the fundamental representation but this formula generalizes to any representation in the first tensor factor where you have just to replace m1 with another object even though i didn't i don't have a completely close formula but uh, concerning l12 l13 and so on and so forth they have all a very similar structure, in particular, if uh, the GL star factor here, these guys are realized trivial. If this bit is trivial, which is what you do if you really want Q operators, then the expression for the L operator is, is very similar to this one. But there also exists uh, analogs of Shastri's or matrix for general GL M slash N, right? Like coupling. Uh, there is, uh, but so you can probably yeah, repeat the same story. Yeah, that I imagine, yes. But somehow I, I was told that they are not really, I, I don't know, I never really look at this high rank generalization of the upper. But somehow they are not quite as, as interesting as far as I could tell. As far as, they're not as quite as non-trivial as upper, but maybe I'm wrong. I just, I, I didn't look at those models. But yeah, I believe, I imagine that uh, if, if these are matrices are there with high rank, then one can repeat a similar story. Yes. But those other higher ranks they will not have this kind of fancy centrally extended. This is very specific to GL22. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you don't know what, what these things are going to be based on, these higher rank things. There is, I mean, there is some work, but uh, I don't know exactly how non trivial are these other matrices. In what way is it specific? Uh, 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 is it not true that any SU n slash m, SU n slash n admits some central extension? The central extension is definitely a special thing, a very special thing of, of GL2 slash 2. If you don't know, you know, what, what am I, sorry. Uh, you can just convince yourself, you can do it more mathematically, like classify extensions, but if you look at just the algebra, or, can you see my screen, right? Yes, yes. If you look at just the algebra, you see, uh, you know, the epsilon tensor here exists only for GL2 slash 2. So, and you want the thing to be, uh, of course, you know, this is a bracket. So it's, it's symmetric when you exchange AB and alpha beta simultaneously. So, you know, a pair of epsilon. So if, if you don't know, you know, without knowing anything, you just look at these equations and you see that you cannot generalize them until, unless you have GL2 slash 2. Then mathematically, you can prove things if you want. This is the intuitive reason why all EGL2 slash 2 admits a central extension. Another way to see this is to, 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 to recall the fact that this, this algebra can be viewed as a special limit of exceptional superalgebra D21 alpha. And mm -hmm. in the name is, is exceptional. Yeah. OK. okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. So, the reason why this one part, I mean, it's a remarkable fact that there exists a finite dimensional Lie algebra, Lie super algebra with one parameter, this D to one alpha is remarkable. And it's definitely the same reason why there is this triple central extension here. Yeah, right. Okay. But yeah, so what one thing I find quite exciting is this uh, uh, higher dimensional, you know. Uh, putting in quantum space this bound state representation, which I don't know if somebody, I know that probably Seth Frollo was working on it some time ago. I don't know if, yeah, I don't know what happened to that, but there was some issue with hermeticity, but sometimes it's not that important. Uh, yeah, putting higher representation in quantum space, I think is, is still an interesting question. Any more questions? Sorry, Carlo, can you comment one more time when you have this uh, uh, deformed uh, twist type uh, which you apply uh, to the M, and then when you define this at the very end? Sorry, I didn't catch. 
Yeah. Can you repeat? Sorry. Yeah, I think when you get to the one of the last slides, when you define the shift to the Q, Q, Q relations. Yes. And you, when you have this deformed uh, twist applied to the your M, I'm just curious. Okay, can you recap? Now I think later. You want uh, th this, this formula? Yes. So you have this for the lux, but now, and uh, can you get to the next slide? So you have to this deformed twist, but the uh, deformed twist. What do you mean? This is the. I mean, for on both on both sides, and then you 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 define uh, how do you define your your uh, spectral parameters? This is still the, the, the it is still on on the same uh, on the same curve. Uh, this is a, a good question, of course. Uh, here, u is capital U is a complex number, possibly invertible, but I think you can kind of uh, get rid of the yeah, zero yeah. point, but doesn't matter so much. Uh, let's say it's invertible, and uh, and now. One has to, has to go to the analysis for all sets i, and uh, in fact, is the spectral parameter uh, and representation labels of these uh, what is it of these factors are entangled in a bit of a complicated way, like, like for this Cuban state for Cuban state representation. Then they are entangled in a pretty simple way, which is just this one. So, the, but you see that the spectral parameter depends on the represent, you know, on the representation of GL two slash two. You are you are using, you are rotating with the auto automorphism. The same is true for the other set i. So, it, I didn't mention, I didn't show all the cases because it's a bit long list and a bit complicated. But uh, in general. The parameters on which Li depends are morally one spectral parameter and the representation label of this uh, of uh, sorry of this factor. So one spectral parameter and the representation label of this factor, but they satisfy some pretty complicated relation, some sort of curve that uh, involves the Casimir of this GL of these factors. Okay, and, okay, okay, okay. Uh -huh. And it's a bit complicated, but if these factors are realized trivially, so all these Casimir are zero. And these guys are realized clearly. Then the spectral parameters is what I wrote in this footnote here, in this note here. So if the set i is one, two, or three, four, the spectral parameter lives on this curve. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's, it's a complex number like for L one. Okay. So the I of this answer. But this is the spectral parameter, of course, in auxil in the you know in this yeah. fundamental space. Then there is always the spectral parameter associated to x plus and x minus. Sorry. I didn't define x bar minus, but it's just one over x minus. Sorry about that. Okay, thank you. So if there are no more questions, let uh, thank Carlo again. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So thank you for the, uh, for listening. I hope you did the couple stuff. <laughs> okay, so this was the 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 last um, uh, meeting. Um,